with us, then you know that we're studying the book of Matthew, and we come this morning, as Taylor just read, to Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 15. To provide just a little bit of context, we are in the middle of a section of scripture here in Matthew where Jesus is asserting his authority over and above the established religious authorities of his day. They're in Jerusalem. This began back in Matthew 21 as Jesus came riding into Jerusalem, fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy that a king would come riding on the back of a donkey. And it continues as Jesus teaches through this section. And we'll continue until about chapter 23. And so just to kind of illustrate, I have a, a red balloon in my pocket, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chicken out. So I've been in children's ministry for a few years, and I was thinking through how to illustrate this building tension and frustration, this welling up of anger that the Pharisees and the religious leaders are experiencing as Jesus exerts his authority over them. And so just think of a red balloon. And each time that Jesus teaches from, from Genesis, uh, excuse me, Matthew 21 and forward, Jesus riding in on a donkey, so a puff of air goes into that balloon. Jesus accepts praises from children, a bit more blood rushing to the faces of the Pharisees. Jesus cleansing the temple, that would have been incredibly disruptive and inconvenient. And so anger welling up in the minds of the religious authorities. Jesus cursing a fig tree. Jesus stumping the chief priest and the elders. This would have been embarrassing. This would have been frustrating. And so there's a, a frustration and a tension. We all know what happens when too much air goes into a balloon. Eventually, it bursts, Right? And so there's tension, there's frustration welling up in the minds and lives of the Pharisees and the religious leaders. We could jump ahead to maybe chapter 26 where they decide to kill Jesus, or we, we know where this is going with the crucifixion. And so where the balloon bursts, I don't know, I don't know where we want to push that illustration to, but there's a lot of frustration on the part of the Pharisees. And so after the parable of the wedding feast, the Pharisees must have gotten together to discuss how are we going to deal with this man? This guy's making a mess of things with his teaching. If we let this continue, who knows what's going to happen? And so someone in the group must have come up with the idea. Let's go to him. Let's ask him some questions. Let's get him talking. Let's see if we can get him comfortable. And maybe he'll say something that will condemn himself before the Roman authorities. Maybe we can get him thrown into a Roman jail. Or at the very least, we can... We can get him talking and get him to say something that will result in him losing favor with this Jewish populace, this crowd of people that love to hear him teach. So that's what we're going to be dealing with today, a reaction from the established religious leaders who are growing in their anger and frustration with Jesus and his teaching. So look down at Matthew 22, verse 15. We see, then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. So verses 15 through 33, we have a series of questions put before Jesus for the purpose of entangling him in his words. They want to entrap him. They want him to get him to say something that's going to get himself into trouble. As I said, to get him to lose support with his followers or best case scenario, to get him thrown into Jail. Verse 16, they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. Well, isn't that nice? Isn't that a nice introduction? What better way to hide sinister intentions than with flattery, right? They want Jesus to be at ease. They think they can build a quick rapport with Jesus. They want him to relax. Right? They don't want him to be on the, the defensive or to be sharp. They want him to feel like he's amongst friends, which I think is a bit comical. I can't imagine that they thought that this would really work. Several other things that are interesting here. The Pharisees didn't go to Jesus with questions about paying taxes. They sent the junior Pharisees. They sent the B team. They sent the neophyte Pharisees to question Jesus. It's likely that they're attempting to disarm him. They want him to be complacent and relaxed, and they think that maybe the B team will set him at ease. It's also very possible that at this point, Jesus recognizes the Pharisees. He knows the Pharisees, and so if they come and he sees them, he's immediately going to be sharp and defensive in the way that he deals with them, and that doesn't serve their intentions in the question they're about to ask. It's also interesting that the Herodians are working in conjunction with the Pharisees, so we don't know a little history and a little context, and that slips past us. But these two groups of people would not have gotten along. 
They would not have normally associated with one another. The Pharisees resented Roman occupancy and rule in Jerusalem, while the Herodians more or less profited from it. So these are two distinctly different groups of Jewish leaders who normally would not have gotten along with each other coming together for the purpose of undermining Jesus and his teaching. The reason for this strange alliance relates to the nature of the conversation and questioning that they're about to have. We can skip, a, skip ahead just a little bit to the bottom part of verse 17. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? If Jesus says no, then the, Herod, the Herodians are there. They're the perfect people there and placed as loyal to Rome to witness and condemn Jesus before Roman authorities. And if he says yes, then the Pharisees, or at least the junior Pharisees, are there to condemn Jesus before the Jewish populace who hated the idea of paying taxes to this subjugate, subjugating authority. These two groups that didn't like each other hated Jesus and his challenges to their established authority even more. And so they're coming together in this effort to be rid of Jesus. Verse 17. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not. And so they get to their question, and we know what's at stake. The trap has been laid, and seemingly whatever Jesus says next is going to get him into trouble. They think they've got him boxed in. They think they have him backed into a corner. And of course, they wanted a simple yes or no answer. That would have been preferable, yes or no. The yes resulting in decreased popularity with patriotic Jewish people resenting Roman rule, and the no resulting in the Herodians condemning Jesus before the Romans. Verse 18, but Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Why put me to the test? So the flattery didn't work. (laughs) Verse 19, show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render or give back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Jesus' answer here is quite brilliant, indicated by their response. The response of the Pharisees and the Herodians. Verse 22, when they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away. So they didn't get what they had hoped for. A simple yes or no that resulted in Jesus' condemnation. Instead, they get worldview instruction. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. In the realm of civil authorities, honor, respect, and obey your civil authorities. And to the Lord, what is the Lord? So as it relates to God, honor, respect, and obey. Give to the Lord what's expected from the Lord. Jesus, in a couple of pithy one-liners, busts up a false dichotomy that to pay taxes to Caesar is opposed to God. Or to not pay taxes to Caesar is to somehow demonstrate a greater piety towards God. Jesus' teaching is very possible to respect, honor, and obey civil authorities while respecting, honoring, and obeying the Lord. Jesus is acknowledging here two realms of authority. He says to his questioners, you're under the authority of God, and so give to God what rightfully belongs to God, and give to the government what rightfully belongs to the government. Jesus is essentially looking around and he's pointing at aqueducts and courts and roads and Uh, the relative peace and stability of the community in which they live, the Pax Romana. He's looking around and pointing at these things and saying, these things are provided to you by Caesar. And so give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Pay your taxes. These things come at a cost. And give to the Lord what belongs to the Lord. And so the principle here that Jesus gives is, is straightforward enough. An applicational principle. There is no incompatibility between properly respecting and honoring your civil authorities, and honoring God. That's the principled application. We should all be able to agree to that with relative ease. The Bible teaches that all authority belongs to God. So it's true in Genesis 1, it's true in Exodus 1 through 12. It's true in every aspect of the Bible. It's true when God raises up foreign governments to come in and sweep off his rebellious people into exile. And it's true here in Jerusalem for the Jewish people under the thumb of of Roman rule. Jesus is going to say later in Matthew 28 to, to end the gospel that all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. And so God has both the might and the right 
to rule. All authority in heaven and earth are his. But he does delegate authority to civil governments, as is affirmed in today's passage. And so I want us to think just a little bit about delegated authorities to to dig into a more practical application. How should we live and move and operate in a world with multiple authority structures, a world in where we have obligations to different authorities? Knowing that God has all authority and that God delegates some authority to civil governments, we're, we're confronted with that right here in our passage today. But I want to I add to that, we also know from Scripture that God has delegated authority to the church. And so a, a, a healthy church is going to have a structure to it. So many of you will have, would have heard we are an elder-led, deacon-served congregational church. And every person in the church at every level has an authority to exercise. God's people have jobs to do. Elders are to teach the word, set a godly example, and rule the church. Minus by what authority? By an authority given to them by God. Deacons have jobs to do as they exercise authority within the church, going about meeting needs, maintaining unity, and supporting the elders. Church members have jobs to do. God has given you the members of the church and authority to exercise the keys of the kingdom, as we like to say in reference to Matthew 16. You've been given responsibility and the corresponding authority to speak the truth in love to one another for the purpose of mutual edification and encouragement. So God delegates authority to the church. And God delegates authority to the home. Ephesians 5, we could flip over there. This would be a bit of a rerun for our college students this morning. Ephesians 5, verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and he and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to your husbands. Ephesians 6, 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And so scripture teaches that God, who has all authority, has delegated some authority to husbands to lead their families and to to husbands and wives to parent their children. There's an authority structure within the home. We could talk about employer and employee authority structures, but we could talk about uh, delegated authorities to the self, and so for the purpose of self-governance, but not to broaden things out too, too much, I just want to, you to see this morning that um, God, who has all authority, has delegated authorities to civil government, to the church, and to the home, and for our good. And so how do we think about interacting, living, and moving in a world where there's different authorities and different authority structures over us. Let me give you some points of practical application. Point number one, know, be, and do what God's word says. God is the ultimate authority. All authority belongs to him. This book is the very word of God. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, and correcting, and training in righteousness. This word is the only certain rule for faith and obedience. So what does it mean to render to the Lord what belongs to the Lord? It means knowing, being, and doing what this book teaches. Submitting ourselves to God and his word in all things. Point number two, we're to respect authority. Romans 13 is instructive and helpful here. Romans 13, verse 1, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. And so it's quite incredible that Jesus tells the Jewish people to pay their taxes to this foreign subjugating power that will inevitably use those resources to keep them in subjugation. The taxes paid to the government authorities will be used to keep their thumb on the Jewish people. It's an unbelievable reality. Jesus says, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Christian men and women, we have an incredible responsibility 
to honor and obey the authorities over us in the small things and in the big things. We're to honor and respect and obey the good politicians and the bad politicians, the good laws and the bad laws. Differing politics and disagreement with our leaders isn't grounds for discarding and disobeying authorities over us. We will be uncomfortable in a way, in one way or another, with our government. We won't like some of the recommendations and requirements that they push down towards us. We will feel like they are exercising authority in areas of our lives that are sacred and private, telling us what we can do with our kitchen remodel. It just doesn't feel good. How is that their business? And friends, I just want to remind you this morning, as Paul tells Titus to remind his people, Titus chapter 3, verse 3, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. So the Jewish people hated this tax. They hated the Roman presence around them. It was incredibly intrusive. And Jesus says to them, Render to the Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. Pay your taxes. Submit yourselves to the authorities over you. Point number three. Practical application point number three. Understand jurisdiction and limits of delegated authority. And so is there ever a time when we should not render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar? Or parents uh, or children should not render to fathers... What fathers deserve. We should not render to the elders what the elders think they deserve. When is it right for us to disobey the authorities over us? And the common and I believe correct principle that's often given here is that when commanded to disobey God's word, we kick back, we push back. Or when forbidden from obeying God's word, we bump back. And so that's the principle for us. When forbidden to obey, or commanded to disobey, we need to consider a higher authority. The ultimate authority, we've said already, is Christ. We have to obey his word. When another delegated authority over us commands us to disobey or forbids us from obedience. It's also helpful to understand jurisdiction. And so there will be overlap in different realms of authority. The government will make laws that reach into your home. You won't necessarily appreciate that. Or the elders in the church are going to give instruction and counsel that have impact on the way that you do marriage and on the way that you parent your children. You may not immediately appreciate that. And so there's absolutely gray lines as it relates to jurisdiction and realms of authority. There will be crossing over between the the various realms. But this doesn't become overreach until one delegated authority is forbidding you from doing something that God commands or commanding you to do something that God forbids. Until that point, we respect, we honor, and we obey the authorities over us. Scripture affirms an incredibly high degree of respect and honor towards the authorities in our lives. We're to render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Caesar forbids obedience or requires disobedience, then in those moments we look to a higher authority, who is Christ, the one who has been given all authority in heaven and in earth. And so point number four, submit your life to Christ. I, I have no reason to believe this, but I wonder if uh, one of these neophyte Pharisees who walked away marveling at Christ's brilliant answer hours later looped back around to talk with them. Having been in the presence of Christ, having been confronted and rebuked as a hypocrite, made aware of his his sin, and experiencing the brilliance of Jesus, wouldn't it be great if one of them returned hours later to give to the Lord what the Lord deserves, which is all honor and all glory and all praise. And so submit your lives to Christ. Don't walk away marveling and hardened in your sin. If you haven't given your life to Christ, consider this. This whole section of scripture that we've, we've been walking through over the last few weeks is about Jesus asserting his authority over the established religious authorities. Apart from Christ's work in your life, you are the established religious authority of your own life. 
How will you respond to Christ's word exercising authority over you this morning? Will you respond to the gospel? Will you be rebuked? Will you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and look to him as the ultimate authority of your life? Or will you maintain yourself, your autonomy, your own authority over your own life? Give your life to Christ. Submit yourself to the authority of the word of Christ. Okay, we're going to move to the next set of verses. So we're halfway there. We have here a record of another conversation, this time between the Sadducees and Jesus. Once again, we're going to see that these men, like the Herodians and the Pharisees, tried to frustrate Jesus with a different question. Like them, they hoped to entangle and entrap Jesus in his teaching in order to do harm to his reputation. And like the Pharisees, they're going to walk away marveling and astonished at Jesus, totally defeated in their efforts. Look at verse 23. The same day, Sadducees came to him, who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. These men come to Jesus with a question that relates to what's known in the Old Covenant law as Levirate marriage. You can flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 25, 5 through 10, and write that down if you want to look it up later. But this will give us an idea of what this question is referring to. If a brother, or excuse me, if brothers dwell together, and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as a wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son, whom she bears, shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. So this is, of course, a very strange law to us. But in ancient Israel, the passing on of family names and the inheritance tied to those names was vitally important. And so as odd as it sounds to our modern ears... This is a law of protection, a law that would protect widows and children. This was a way of preserving family lines and making sure that those who would otherwise be destitute due to the death of a spouse are cared for. Back at verse 25. Here's the the scenario that the Sadducees put before Jesus. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So too the second and third, down to the seventh. And after them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. How about that for a question? Does anybody listen to or read? Ask Pastor John, John Piper, he asks questions, or ask anything with Al Mohler. Well, this is ask anything to Jesus' version. They're not playing by the rules. They're trying to make him look foolish, which is not the idea of those other programs. But how about that? For I want to know, why not, why not 14 brothers, you know? Why not 21? So very, very likely this is a hypothetical uh, reality. It's just created up out of thin air to make Jesus look foolish, right? And so why, why just seven brothers? Why not 14 brothers, right? The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. They're attempting to make a mockery of both Jesus and the doctrine of the resurrection with this question that is most likely hypothetical, Conjured up. It reminds me of questions like, can God create a rock so heavy that he can't lift it? Or can Jesus, or rather, can God count to infinity? You know, this, this type of questioning is what came to mind as I read over this. The Sadducees think they've hit a home run in undermining the resurrection. This question, how can this woman be equally the spouse of these seven men for eternity? That's strange and impossible, and and therefore there can be no resurrection. This is their logic. The Sadducees are looking around at each other, and I imagine, you know, grins are kind of working their way onto their faces. They think they've hit hit a home run here. They've knocked one out of the park. And uh, Jesus responds in verse 29. He answers them. He looks at them. He answers them, you're wrong because you don't know Scripture and because you don't know the power of God. How about that for a response? Exercising authority over the religious authorities. You're wrong because you don't know Scripture, because you don't know the power of God. I love it. Verse 30, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, 
but are like angels in heaven. I'll read Jesus' response from Luke, the same uh, account in the Gospel of Luke. It's a little bit more detail, maybe a little, understand, a little easier to understand in some ways. Luke 20, verse 34 through 36, And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. So in this place, in this world, in our experience, people are given in marriage. Verse 35, But those who are considered worthy to attain to the age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. So the Sadducees' two errors were that they didn't know Scripture well enough to understand that there would be a resurrection. And two... They didn't know or believe in the power of God to create a world that is far greater than the one in which they live. Friends, God has the power to recreate a world that is far better than the one in which we live. I hope you believe that. Scripture gives us some glimpses into what this world will be like, this resurrected world, this recreated world. Our dwelling place will be with God. He will dwell with us and we will be his people. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Death will be no more. There will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more sickness. There will be no more selfishness. Relational strife and fighting will be no more. Our struggle with sin, habitual sin that comes for us on an hourly if not daily basis will be no more. God is making all things new. And it will be good. It will be very, very good. The only resurrected world the Sadducees could imagine was the same as this one. And if the same, then how could this woman be married to these seven men? These were simple men who didn't understand the power of God. Second, they asked question, or, or they asked this question because they didn't know. The scriptures, or rather, they chose to disregard portions of scripture. So these were ancient, modern-day liberals who threw out large portions of scripture that they didn't prefer. They essentially adhered to the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, and the rest they eliminated, which eliminated it does eliminate a great deal of teaching on the resurrection, but not all. Importantly, not all. And Jesus knows this, and his response to the Sadducees is brilliant in this sense. So look at verse 31. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowds heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. So Jesus quotes God speaking to Moses from a burning bush. And at this time... Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would have been dead and buried for many, many years. Two centuries had passed away since Jacob, the last of these three, went to his tomb. And yet God spoke of these men as if they remained his people and as if he was still their God. Isn't that fascinating? God, God could have, Jesus could have quoted Daniel 12 too, as, as John and Paul will later do in other places in the New Testament. Daniel 12, 2, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and, and everlasting contempt. Isaiah 26, 19, your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You will dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for your dew is a dew of light and the earth will give birth to the dead. And so according to Isaiah, the dead are dust-dwelling sleepers. And the resurrection will wake them up. The earth will one day give birth to the dead and the resurrection. And the reality of the resurrection is a comfort to the psalmist. Psalm 71, 19 through 21. Your righteousness, O God, reaches the high heavens. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you. You who have made me see many troubles and calamities will revive me again. From the depths of the earth, you will bring me up again. You will increase my greatness and comfort me again. So the Old Testament teaches the resurrection. But Christ takes his Sadducee audience 
to this passage in Exodus because he knows that we'll have this special ability, a particular ability to poke holes in their arguments and in their understanding. Jesus says, don't you know the scriptures? God in the form of a burning bush says, I am the God of Abraham, present tense. I am the God of Isaac, present tense. And the God of Jacob, present tense. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. This news delivered in this way would have had a potent effect on the Sadducees. Look at verse 33. When the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. And so for the second time, Jesus' questioners are silenced. And they go away astonished at Jesus' wisdom, his eloquence, and his genius. I want to finish up our time together with two more application points from this second section, or from this second question put to Jesus. Point number one, know the scriptures. The Sadducees made the mistake that they did because they didn't know the scriptures. Friends, know the scriptures. Let me just read from Psalm 19 to you. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. And so my encouragement is, don't be like the Sadducees. Know the word of God. Know the scriptures. Immerse yourself in scripture. And if you do, there will be great reward, according to Psalm 19. Know the scriptures. Point number two, consider your eternity. So the gospel is the power of God to save. And there will be a resurrection and a day of standing before the Lord. And so consider eternity. Think on Paul's words as he finishes up his address at the Areopagus in Athens. In Acts 17, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Consider eternity. Will you go away mocking, as some in Athens did? Or will you loop back around for more questions and ultimately put your faith in Christ, as some in Athens did? How will you respond to what you're hearing this morning? The religious establishment comes face to face with the brilliance of Jesus, and they go away marveling. And astonished and hardened in their sin. They don't turn to Jesus. Will you consider your eternity this morning? Will you walk this morning? Will you walk away this morning marveling at Christ's brilliance but hardened in your sin? Or will you give your life to Christ? Will you repent and believe?